Hello everyone, welcome to PS Platypus. It's Kyle here today, and we're going to go through an introduction to evidence-based medicine. So what is evidence-based medicine? Really, it's the fusion or the meeting point of three separate concepts. Clinical expertise, which is what the clinician understands their experience and their knowledge. Patient values, which is what the patient knows and their experience and best available evidence or best available research. So those are scientific studies. And when all three of these come together, what your gut says, what the patient says, and what the research says, that's where you're gonna get evidence-based medicine. So let's apply some principles here. Really, when we're looking at the clinical expertise or the uh, clinical experience, we're talking about the clinician's experiences dealing with similar patients as the one that they are treating. Now, this also involves their interpretation of what, the, of what clinical guidelines exist. So there are clinical guidelines, but they might uh, modify it or based upon their understanding uh, and their experience dealing with similar patients. So uh, the clinical guidelines that are produced for Australia are by the therapeutics Therapeutic Goods Administration, um, and they are a part of the Australian Government Department of Health that regulates the import, supply, manufacture, export, and advertising of therapeutic goods, including complementary and alternative medicines, as well as clinical guidelines produced by specialist bodies, um, so other organizations with more specialized uh, areas of research. And there are two main concepts that we need to get across here with medications that are TGA listed or versus TGA re registered. Medications or other um, complementary and alternative medicines, basically therapeutic goods, goods that are intended to have a, uh, a positive effect for the patient. So if it's TGA listed, then its number will start with an L. And that means that it has been um, evaluated by the TGA, and it is understood to be safe and honest. And that's in contrast to TGA registered, where the number starts with an R, and that means that it actually definitely works. So it's been studied and it actually has efficacy for the um, condition or problem that it's trying to treat. So clinical expertise, that's one of the three components of evidence-based medicine. The next one is patient values and beliefs. So it's very important to think about the, per the person or the people that you're actually treating uh, in medicine, uh, especially in evidence-based medicine. And so you need to listen to them and avoid ridiculing what they say um, in terms of their experience. It sounds straightforward, but it's important to note. Um, so noting whether they're experiencing side effects, what those side effects are, um, what other alternatives they understand there to be, um, the costs for the patient, not only financial, but also uh, other more um, abstract costs. And the interaction of the medication with the patient's desires. So what are their goals of care? Um, what are they aiming to have out of the, the medicine? What, what, is their, what are their goals? And finally, we've got best available evidence. So this is uh, being aware of what the current literature says. So the research is always developing and new treatments will come out. Old treatments will be determined to be less effective than they were originally believed to be, or may actually have harms, or may just not be at work as well as other medications that have been developed. Um, or other, other treatments. So it doesn't always have to be a drug. Um, and so it is part of evidence-based medicine to actually stay aware of what is in the medical literature, as well as considering that there may be biases affecting the literature. So things like publication bias, citation bias, and database bias. So you might not be seeing all of the evidence or it might be skewed from uh, being actually truly accurate. And finally, the final slide here, we're going to talk through some barriers to evidence-based medicine. So what are things that prevent us from properly practicing evidence-based medicine? And then we'll go over the five A's.
which is the process of evidence-based medicine. So one, one barrier is resistance, resistance to change. So this is now a bit outdated, but evidence-based medicine compared to perhaps more traditional patriarchal um, approaches to medicine may mean that some, some clinicians uh, feel uh, a bit threatened by it. And that also ties in with the second point here, clashing with existing ingrained knowledge. So new findings and new developments may actually be threatening to someone's reputation if they've uh, spent their life researching or endorsing a specific treatment, and it turns out that that is less effective or um, more harmful than it was originally believed to be, and a, another treatment is indicated, then you can imagine how um, someone might be a bit more resistant to practicing uh, the practicing evidence-based medicine and moving forward with new findings. In terms of accessibility, um, it is quite hard to find that best available evidence if you don't have some sort of access to it. Um, so what James here, who's written the slides today, thank you very much, James, has said is try accessing journals without your student account. It is very hard aside from perhaps PubMed to actually um, see journal articles, especially if you're trying to see the full the full text and not just an abstract. So it's it's costly um, to actually access um, studies and research. And then also cost and effort of implementation. So implementing studies um, and then once you've got findings, actually changing the pra your practices or the practices of entire healthcare systems costs a lot and takes a lot of effort. So that challenges EBM and you have to find ways around that and recognizing a lot of the time that you have to adapt to the new evidence for the best of the patient and also usually eventually for cost effectiveness. And finally, if you've ever looked up uh, even one study, you'd probably realize that it's it takes a lot of time to look um, to look through even one study, let alone all of the medical literature on a specific topic. Uh, it takes time, not only that, but also effort and training. So in order to properly assess a, a, or appraise an article, um, I think, yeah, if, if you tried to do it before you'd learned how to read a journal article, it, it'd be very intense and quite challenging. Um, and you'd probably misinterpret it a bit. But that's where things like uh, systematic reviews, literature reviews, and um, meta-analyses. So systematic reviews and meta-analyses come in where people have taken the time and effort and training to appraise a lot of the evidence and then synthesize it into something that summarizes um, the best available evidence on a specific topic. So there are ways to approach each of these barriers, but they are important to note and acknowledge the same as any other biases um, that challenge approaching this. And then finally, we've got the five A's. So this is the process that we go through to um, practice evidence-based medicine. So that's asking a reasonable question, accessing the best available research and evidence, then appraising that evidence. So actually evaluating it um, and going, how applicable is it to the the patient that I'm considering treating, then applying the evidence to the patients. So that's once again, sort of evaluating how you're actually going to be able to apply this to the patients and then assessing how the, this whole process has gone and how the, the treatment has gone for that patient. All right, thank you very much. And I hope you have a nice day.